Okay, we're at 75 right now, but so I'm going to start up. Okay, close. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, uh, whatever time of the day it is for you. Welcome to another edition of uh, Poetry with Prakriti. Uh, briefly, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Prakriti Foundation is an arts and culture NGO in Chennai that was founded in 1998. Uh, it has been a space for practitioners of various arts, uh, academics, critics, and the people who uh, love these arts to congregate, to get together, chat, uh, engage in a serious, on a serious platform. Uh, the foundation organizes a number of events in uh, Chennai and in other parts of India as well, uh, including several annual festivals. One of them is Poetry with Prakriti. Uh, traditionally, Poetry with Prakriti happens in December in uh, Chennai and poets from all over India and other parts of the world, uh, whenever budgets permit, uh, also, you know, uh, come in and they, they read and perform their work to audiences in a variety of uh, venues, ranging from the traditional, which are, you know, things like bookshops and art galleries, to the very unconventional, like shopping malls or metro trains or, you know, public other places where you don't normally think of these being venues for poetry. And uh, poets are reading to this wide variety of people all over, uh, attending each other's gatherings, meeting each other. Klaus and I, uh, Klaus, our, our guest uh, today, uh, met at Poetry with Prakriti 10, 11 years ago, uh, precisely because of this, we would never have met otherwise because we were both guests of Poetry with Prakriti. Uh, I will, uh, yes, uh, like I said, normally this happens in Chennai. But of course, thanks to the pandemic and all the restrictions on us on public gathering and on travel, uh, last year in October, uh, the foundation decided that they would do an online version of Poetry with Prakriti. And the way the shape it has taken is that on the first three Saturdays of every month, every Saturday there is a different poet who reads from their poetry for 15, 20 minutes and then engages in conversation with the moderator or and the audience, of course, we look forward to questions from the audience. Uh, this has been happening since October. We've had poets from all over India, uh, several poets from abroad, uh, and like Klaus, who is joining us today from Denmark. And uh, this will continue on till the end of this year. The poster you may have seen says October, but uh, if I could let you into a little secret, it will carry on beyond October as well. And we do hope that you will continue to join us, not just because I know some of you are here because of your college being associated with this particular event. We do hope that you will continue to come in and attend other events, whether your, your, your college is uh, associate, uh, associating with us or not. Uh, so why am I saying colleges right now? The festival has traditionally hosted poets in a, variety, in a number of colleges around the city and has close relationships with them. And some of these events, some of the readings have been presented in association with uh, colleges in Chennai and other parts of India as well. And uh, when they come in, they bring in their students. We, we, we hope to have some of their teachers as well. And we hope that this also leads to uh, a further association between the poets and the college. So uh, that's enough for me for now. And uh, I would like to invite to uh, say a few words and to introduce our poet today, Professor uh, Hema Pani from uh, SNDV BP College. Uh, if you could welcome our guest today, please, Hema. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Uh, it was a nice introduction about Prakriti and uh, thanks, Meda and the uh, uh, Prakriti Association for collaborating with us for quite long years. Uh, we are re really happy to welcome Peter Ankerson, today's poet, whose uh, reading we are waiting to listen to. And ours is Srimati Devkunwal Nanalal Bhatt Vaishnav College for Women. 
Uh, we are hosting this program along with Prakriti today. On behalf of our college, on behalf of our uh, management, principal, and the faculty, as well as the students of our college, we would like to give you a very warm welcome to this program uh, clause. And we are very happy to listen to you. Yeah, uh, before we could start the reading, I would like to introduce, uh, just give a short bio of Klaus. Um, uh, he's, a tra he's trained as a cultural anthropologist at the University of Copenhagen and USCB. He writes poetry, prose, and nonfiction. He translates, does literary activism, and works with cross disciplinary hybrids with the words as a constant element. He is the author of 16 books and works internationally. Having performed and worked with his literature in more than 20 countries all over the world, spirituality, language, hermitism, and systems critique are among the areas investigated in Ankerson's literature. And he is often likened to colleagues such as the beat poet Alan Grisberg and the magician Alistair Crowley. His recent collection of poems, River of Man, is published by Red River. Here we go. We are eager to listen to you, Klaus. Thanks for joining this program. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, and you. Klaus, now all over to you. And uh, I'll come back on camera in a little while once uh, you're done with the first part of the reading to chat. Look forward to that and look forward to listening to your poetry. Uh, folks, please welcome Klaus Ankerson. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Hema. Uh, Hi folks, I'm very happy to be here today. It should have been physical. It should have been live on a stage in your auditorium, in your college. Um, but this will have to do, as you all know, you know why. Um, I'm gonna read to you today from this book. I don't know if you can see it. It's called River of Man and it's subtitle is Indian Poems. Uh, it's basically a, a, po a, a book of travelogue a poetry that is written uh, in most of it in, in 2019, um, where I did a, a small 5,000 kilometer train ride um, around India, basically. And uh, without further ado, I'll start reading to you this poem. It's about the, the great big cities of India. It's called Ladies Night. I have met them, Mother India's daughters, Auntie Delhi, firstborn, stern and grandiose, chain smoking in green silk and strolling around house cars, around and around the eye of the old crown. Her all seeing vision all over the land. She is the bookkeeper. Auntie Calcutta, older, but also younger, the intellectual keeper of the collective library in the heart of the family, the letter stands between strangers united by the good word. This daughter stands with the oppressed. Auntie Bombay, the unruly two-faced little sister, dancing on the tables at night, trading gold for glitter. Mariman Point dreaming, her swinging skirts home to the Indian dream of change and rupees enough. Auntie Chennai, the conservative, upholds tradition through modernity in her choice of saris, rummages around and through the house, the rooms, like educated winds of fortune. Auntie Hyderabad, the isolated one, the middle sister, almost too busy and almost too hot for her own good, still outgrowing her dresses constantly too short for her long strides, all that signature biryani and sweet breath of summer. Auntie Delhi married an ambitious clerk. Auntie Calcutta, a poet rebel. Auntie Bombay hits the jack of all trades. Auntie Chennai, a pandit. And Auntie Hyderabad found a banker. Their daughters are plentiful, their eyes Whole treasures of golden souls dreaming of wider horizons and plenty for all. This next one is called I Have a Friend in India. I have a friend in Shillong with a round head and a big heart. 
I have a friend in Bhubaneswar with a slight limp, and I have a friend in Kolkata who can always use a blanket and lights his joints paper thin. I have a friend from the interiors of Tamil Nadu who once taught me how to brush my teeth with a neem branch. I have a friend from Chennai who insists on being a madrasi and paints what she sees. She once took me to a Nadi reader who found my palm leaf and told me of hidden enemies. I have a friend in Pondicherry with the world in his hand every day at exactly four o'clock. I have a friend in Bangalore and a dozen in Mumbai. I have friends in Delhi and friends in Agra, friends in Pune and in Hyderabad. I've got a friend on the Andaman Islands, a dive master head high on life and cold beer and a friend who lived in that French Indian island. I have a friend in Nanu Arunachal Pradesh and now I'm going since perhaps I will meet a new friend. I don't have any friends from Nagaland, but wait, I have a friend from Goa, even though I've never been there and never seen a Russian citizen on the subcontinent. I have a friend, India. This next one is called Fair Share. My skin embodies the double bind of post-colonialism. I get special treatment and pay extra. The first I never tire of and the second gets to me. After a few months, I realize everything is shared here except money. Lakshmi is kept in a small golden cage close to people's hearts, her fleeing nature too unruly. This is about opposites. It's called that love shit. Opposites attract. Deep inside the wheel of the East, matters of the heart are private. Intimacy is sacred and must be kept from the prying eyes of strangers. In the star of the West, it must be publicly shared to be real sustainable. Inversely, proportionate are the matters of the bowels. In the East, is freely shared, a cleansing on display. In the West, it's a private matter to be kept behind closed doors and dealt with in silence. Perhaps these are simply different aspects of the same. One woman's filth is the other's treasure, like the bougainvillea or the lotus reaching from earth towards heaven, keeping them forever apart as two sides of the same coin, the only one there is. Love and shit, shit and love, shitty love, Love and shit. Moving on to this is another one. This is called Everything is Here. In any pawn shop, you can pay with at least eight different digital currencies. You can get everything fixed on the street. Here, a cobbler in the shade of a palm. There, a coconut walla. While you wait for your chapels to be mended, your purse soon, your belt all fixed on the pavement outside the cardi shop with its hand woven stories of old ways and immortality, not versatility as much as coexistence in 5G builder's paradise where one hunger has replaced another, where the builders are hungry for land and the metro snakes through the living sigil of the city. Have you forgotten the rangoli carefully formed by a little girl's hand as she releases the colored rice flour in a thin stream and draws the day into shape while the sun rises about the lushness of bougainvillea and green? Whether need, greed, or ambition, the hunger is omnipresent. Everything blooms here, everything. real strangers. Most Westerners hate to feel deprived of their position as lone monads among colorful strangers when meeting a fellow white. Mostly we don't recognize each other, simply pretend not to see the family resemblance pass by, walking in the sun on some dusty road, crossing wires, rubble and election posters. 
instant is the self-loathing projected onto the distant cousin invading our private exotic fantasy simply by being in the same space. Sometimes people mistake me for a Russian, but never for a French. Next one. Now we are in uh, Bombay, ladies and gentlemen, Mumbai. This is called Give Me More. Give me more coconut water, sweet pan, onion, rava dosa, papaya, milky coffee, black coffee, sugarcane juice, pani puri, pani puri, and also more pani puri. Give me more of those jaggery fried bitter gourd slices. Give me more idli and more sambar, and give me more of that mint and coconut chutney. Give me tender coconut water and a large old monk. Top it off with soda water only and hand me another one, that fried fish, that curry, and then one, one more of those, you know, I like so much, like you. This next one is uh, dealing with a sort of a blind eye that uh, uh, many people turn to the core and it's called part of me knows. As I write the first line, my bones suddenly shift my attention to the image of being back in the backseat of a white dusty Ola en route to Gandhi International, where the old sick lifts an eyebrow and looks at me angrily from the rear mirror as I drop a small tower of coins in the tiny outstretched hand reaching through the window, through the veil, from one world to another, letting me know that I am trespassing ways. We don't support this, as a friend of a friend, the professor in a clinical psychology revealed as we stopped at another intersection in another small white car on another day, going to another show in the eye of the eye of Mother India's daughter Delhi on the plaza that became a jaw. For that odious look of hypocrisy in the mirror and his turtle slow driving, I tell him it's good when he drops me in front of the brushed steel pillars of Terminal 3. I give him three stars out of five. Part of me knows I wasn't supposed to see the boy, but he knocked on the window for so long he pressed his little face so beautiful and lost, so hard against the window pane. On this day, going home, leaving India, I just couldn't ignore him no longer. Another one. This is about a very special friend or some very special friends that I met in Pondicherry, in the jungle outside of Pondicherry, first time I was in India in 2009, and it's called With Friends in High Places. Speaking of reincarnation, karma, and the miracle factory, disguised as a subcontinent destined to hold the most two legs on the globe, one mustn't forget how flowers bloom eternally, how gods play here, their greatest feats and greatest tricks, tricksters with firecrackers, one and all in gold and green. In the jungle outside Pondicherry, I met a soulmate in a black and white picture hanging on a wall in front of a treadmill in the green room of Vina Panichala's theater. This guy took me traveling, far from my thin legs drumming on the rolling rubber band, a fellow from another time, a scholar, a rebel, a yogi, spinning the threads of my past life into vistas of tomorrow, into dance, into joy, into love applied as action, humor and self-irony, the master key. Now he walks with me, Sri Urobindo Goze, and with him, the mother, always there, also mine. In the little town, which is not so little, Peter Hees, the archivist, jogs along the promenade. Aurobindo laughs and scorns from the other side, while passing doppelgangers pop up in the crowd of living souls of dead bodies. Elsewhere, everything happens while Aurobindo, Mira, Hees, and myself stop by the Indian coffee house on Nehru Street and the now dances outside time. Here, there's always room for one more. 
we can take another one. Delhi pressed into prelude, this one is called. Everybody hates Delhi, just like everybody loves Raymond. Delhi hates none, just herself, a big heart among many, the poet and the rush hour. The poet meets rush hour, this horrible monster in the metro, stampeding human cattle on the seats, swallowed by the blue light from the screens and the tapping of the fingers, little colorful icons trapped in private game worlds. One reads a magazine, four and five make love to the ghost in their machine. To the, to, the, to the ghost in their machine. It's all the telephones who travel with each their own meat avatar in electronic leash. The poet hates civilization, the pressed faces, the lines, the hurt mentality, the lemming behavior, the empty look across the seat, the baloney talk, even with a view to the front window on the third room, it's pretty tight. So hungry. This is going to be the last one in this first part of the session. So hungry. Everywhere youth, hungry to belong, eager to get in. The cages looking so beautiful and glossy from outside, like any old secret spiky and moldy on the inside. People desperate to escape, like entering a utopian dream only for the few. Uh, this was from River of Man, Indian Poems. You can get it on Amazon. Thank you. There's the link again for those of you who missed it earlier. This is where you can pick up this book that Klaus has been reading from. Uh, first, Klaus, uh, on behalf of everyone who cannot be seen and heard because in the audience, on their behalf, Thank you. Thank you. And so let's let's chat a little bit about poetry and you. Uh, when what were your what when did you first encounter? Do you when do you first remember encountering this creature, poetry? I I think it 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 it, it was it was as a teenager, as, as, a, as a 15, 16 year old in high school, I guess. And actually I just found the, 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 the collection actually is, is right here because I'm in my dad's old study now and he, he kept it for all these years. Uh, this is simply the first uh, I ever did as a 15 year old. It's, it's, all about, it's all about searching for love and identity and being very depressed. Uh, all the time. It's very dark poetry. It's very sort of black poetry, depression one, depression two, depression three. I think even though I didn't really know what depression was at that time, but I was entertaining it still as a sort of a romantic thing, I guess. So, so that was the first, um, that was my first sort of slow endeavor with it. And, um, but then uh, I sort of drifted over into prose and, and, and drifted on towards writing essays uh, and actually started publishing my first uh, uh, columns and essays as a, as a 21, as a 20 year old, 21 year old. And then uh, basically university came and academics sort of stole me away from, from literature for some 10, 12 years until I slowly got back into it and started reading poetry again. And, and now, um, 16 books later, here we are, basically. Actually, let's step back a little further. This is you as a poet, as a writer of poetry. What about your encounters with poetry as a reader? When do you first remember understanding that there was this thing called poetry as a child, perhaps? What were your first feelings about poetry? How did you first discover that there was something called poetry and something called prose? I, I think it was uh, it was um, as a very young child um, listening to rhymes 
these nursery rhymes, uh, the APC rhymes. We had very nice. Uh, we had some very nice ones uh, like that, and and it it was just instantly appealing to me. The rhythm, the the structure, the whole, the, the sort of the sort of the sort of rhythmic autonomous play of 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 of, of uh, an image creation that it basically also gave me so that was that was very i was very fascinated uh, with that uh, basically um also an avid reader prose sort of came prose sort of came later i think the first was was these these nursery rhymes in in, in kindergarten basically i think there's so much of those that i used to get us the, the cadence of it the rhythm all of that is enjoyable as a child and easy to you know to remember and of course uh, as many of us have done probably when we were little children also recited to adults at mm -hmm. you know gatherings and things like that uh, the, you you mentioned the the poems you wrote as a teenager uh, were those the first poems that you had written or had you started writing poetry before that no i i think i think uh, basically this was the first uh, this was my my first sort of attempts uh, and I guess it was it was it was uh, spurred by the sort of at that time in the we're talking in the, the beginning of the eighties here, so we're talking very sort of like that was a very sort of sort of social realistic um, sort of wave of poetry uh, back then in, in Denmark, and 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 I was inspired by that and and by by some of the Danish sort of heirs to the beat poetry generation. Um, as well, so um, so that so I guess that was the first uh, inspiration. We don't really have the same in the Danish uh, uh, elementary school uh, system. We don't really have the same sort of um, allegiance to to sort of classic modern poetry as you do in many uh, Indian schools. Uh, so so the whole Parnassus of of of, of sort of classic uh, modernist uh, po poems like Robert Frost and, and Tennyson and all that. We, we the, an average Danish uh, people have no knowledge of any of that basically. You need to go to university probably before you actually are introduced to these to, to these strands of poetry. All you have to search to 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 search it out basically for yourself. So so uh, in the educational tradition here, we're not really schooled in in in, in classical poetry as such. Okay. So uh, what languages were you reading uh, poetry in as a child and? when you grew up and in college? Uh, basically, uh, the Denmark is a, is a very small, um, uh, very small uh, language territory. And uh, basically kids, most kids here only speak Danish. And especially when I was a kid in that generation in elementary school, uh, we, while we did have English from grade five or something we we didn't really speak it uh, i think among the first uh sort of poetry in english i really read that was actually pink floyd lyrics i think I, actually it was pink floyd lyrics from from the album the wall i think that was that was among the first and it, it is actually poetry if you look at those lyrics it's it, it's very simple but very strong and and i think and, and i remember we had that because we had the album the english teacher was probably crazy about pink floyd and uh, yeah, so that that was actually among the first that I remember um, this this uh, these lyrics. Okay, tell us about a little bit about the poetry scene in Denmark. Uh, what is it like? It's uh, it's very uh, much dominated by by basically free form. There's also a few doing 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 rhyme stuff. Then there's of course the whole um, section doing. Uh, doing hip hop and rap and sort of spoken word and, and and slamming poetry and stuff, which is not as big as it was 10, 10 15 years ago, sorry. <clears throat> and then there is, so the page poetry is basically bigger than stage poetry here. And um, it's still very, there has been a lot of like experimentation with form. Uh, there's been a lot of, poetry sort of uh, arranged as 
ultra short pros basically that was pretty uh, in like uh, recently and um and some people have done novels uh, like that where basically it's it's for the untrained eye you can't really it can be pretty hard to see whether it's a novel or it's a collection of poetry just put like prose or or what it is but also i guess it maybe it doesn't matter because uh, as i don't remember who said it maybe i think it was some german um uh, literature um scientist that said it. it's a, it's a poem if you think if you say it's a poem so uh yeah okay and uh i mean i know a lot of europe tends to be uh bilingual and uh you know there's a lot more cultural exchange between countries rather like india in the sense that india most people <coughs> tend to be at least in the metros tend to be bilingual trilingual uh you know most people will have the local language uh plus whatever they are speaking in uh you know wherever they've come from because in the in metro india a lot of people move around and of course we're a much larger country and a much larger population but uh what is the relationship between writing in English in Denmark and the average Danish uh, person? How much writing, how much poetry that is in like, or not just English, but in other languages as well. What, how much does Denmark uh, read from other parts of the world? I, I think, uh, I think the English is probably the main second language here. So, uh, the young all the young people can all they can all they can all read english everybody watches uh, american and english this language films and television shows all the time so so i think there is a certain fluency in in english here um as for writing in english as original or original material in english there's very 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 few Danish uh, writers and poets that are doing that. It basically, I think you can maybe count them on one hand, if at all, that many. So, so that's pretty rare. Um, for me, it's been a natural sort of consequence of, of living abroad, traveling a lot, working a lot with that language. And then it sort of just uh, sort of came and, and, and uh, but I, I guess for most people, it's they most Danish writers and poets they write in Danish and then they can have it translated basically into into English and uh, and basically I think for the the book aficionados here there is a very small percentage that will read books in English and they will also read books in in other languages but mostly I guess it needs to be translated um, into Danish. To when we think about poetry from Europe and uh, poetic traditions uh, in English and in other languages, we do know that you know there are verse forms that originated in Latin, in, Fr in French, in the Romance languages. You read about the villanelles and the you know the sonnets that came from Petrarch and things like. Are there uh, schools of poetry or forms of poetry that are intrinsically Danish? um i i don't think so actually i don't think so i i think uh of course there might be a certain tradition of folk folk songs and stuff but i know I, I i i don't think there is an intrinsic sort of poetry that is that originated here i don't think so um not not really there are something called skilling's visa which is sort of um, sort of rhyme drinking songs from the old days that 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 originated here and that was big at some time but 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 other than that i i don't really know not not in in in, in contemporary poetry there's not not a, a line or a sort of tradition that's being that's being worked on like that you mentioned a little bit earlier that uh young people there was a period of time when people were doing rap and slam and things like that so you know these are uh, traditions of poetry of evolutions of poetry if you like which uh, appeared you know started off in different parts of the world a lot of that 
rap came out of America, came out of the ghettos and came out of poverty and it came out of uh, discrimination and things like that. How do you, why do you think things like rap and slam took off in Denmark? I think uh, basically, I, I think that uh, that the, the it, it, it's 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 a it's a spoken poetry uh, or stage poetry or stage literature is 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 a very powerful instrument for democratization. It's very it's a very great instrument for for giving voice to segments of the population that doesn't necessarily have a, 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 a an easy time being heard. By, by traditional media, for instance, uh, the young younger part of the population. Uh, so, in, in 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 I think that is one of the keys to the to the wild popularity that it's got that 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 it's got gotten in India now, where spoken word is is a big thing, especially in, in Mumbai with the spoken word festival there, and and it's 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 getting pretty big. Um, and uh, here, it's it's it's. It's a, of a different kind. Of course, we also have rap and hip hop that are sort of, uh, but that's more of a sort of. That's more like it's like a Danish Danish version of gangster rap, basically, uh, and it's sort of weird because we don't really have areas like it's it's very strange. But but rap and hip hop, I guess that 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 the gangster rap sort of won the battle internal battle in hip hop and came out victorious uh, and, and the more sort of playful hip hop uh, has retreated to a much smaller niche basically I think it's still there but uh, regrettably because that was more playful and I think the verses were better and the the, the poetry were simply better but uh, and more fun but the gangster rap became the the, the 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 victor in that run I mean the rapping about uh, fictive lives of gold and lots of sexual partners and big cars and huge palaces of gold and glitter and stuff like that you know that's basically what it is and and shooting one's enemies dead and stuff like that so it's not really for me but uh, but that's 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 the state of of contemporary danish rap i guess uh, and um and spoken word is uh spoken word here is it's very um, auto fiction centered. It's very sort of with an ironic twist, with a, with with humor. I think there's a lot of humor in it, a lot of twists and turns, and and sometimes bordering between. It's almost like a mix sometimes between between comedy and poetry, basically, a, a sort of commentary or uh, like a hybrid between these two. Because the thing is, when you when you when you do go live on stage in front of a, a large audience, it, it it's a good thing to be able to fuse those two, to be able to entertain people and, and make them have fun, as well as trying to to introduce uh, new horizons of language and or or metaphorics or image or or whatever you want to uh, put forth it's a very good thing to to combine it with with humor and it entertain people simply uh, so a lot of the material that are stage related seem to tend to include a humorous edge basically it's strange that you know uh, gangster rap would take off in a northern european country that from our perspective out here in india looking there not knowing too much about it seems like a relatively peaceful kind of place you know uh, <laughs> uh, not people going around and doing drive-by shootings with machine guns or whatever it is i mean strangely even rap in india i do remember that back in the 80s and 90s there was rap that was very derivative it was suburban well-off boys and girls spitting lyrics that were about the ghetto and they were you know, suburban middle class kind of kids, and you you couldn't get the connect. And what happened with rap is that somehow in India it seemed to then go away and then come back, and it came up again from the poorer parts of the city. It came from the underarm of the city. It came from you know the slums. It came from deprivation. People who were feeling marginalized, and this rap 
that was born here that is in Indian languages and has all those traditions, it takes tradition and it takes some of the method and form from other parts of the world, but the content is now that much harder and more genuine and more from here, not from here, you know. Mm, that's fantastic. That's a that's a that's a. I knew that that was going on, and I think, I think that there is parallels to to from that to the way it happened in Denmark. That the first wave was basically well-off suburban middle kid middle class kids that sort of tried to copy the 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 the, the, the American uh, songs and the American culture that they saw from the ghetto. And th there is actually now like a a, a second wave. Uh, it's also sort of like gangster rap. But you're, it's actually the same here as you just, uh, it's a very excellent point with people from the, well, of course, it's still Denmark, but but from some slightly marginalized error, uh, areas where they, they're not quite as well off as, as in the other areas um, of the first generation. Uh, so, so it's the same thing that you see here, basically. I mean, being marginalized is relative because it's based mm -hmm. on what you see around you. It doesn't mean that you necessarily have to be poor on some imaginary global scale or very real global scale or not as poor as the kid in the Bombay slums or in the New York ghetto, because that feeling of it is what counts. But yeah, uh, we spent too much time on rap, I think, because I just got sidetracked by how fascinating it is that rap would take off in Denmark and I had no clue. But uh, let's step back a little bit to you and your poetry. Uh, you've traveled around the world a bit. Uh, and uh, I'm also going to take a question that Professor uh, Hema also mm -hmm. asked. And I'm going to ask people in the audience to remember that if you would like to ask questions, please put them into the Q&A box and we will get down to them quickly one by one. But uh, what are the, the subjects, not just the book that, you know, the poems that you read just now, what are the subjects that you have tackled in your poetry over time? Uh, and also, if you could take from there about your writing in English and that, you know, how you married those practices. You were there, you were this Danish, young Danish man writing about Denmark. When did your writing in English start to move and what were the subjects that you handled? Do you find differences? in what you write in Danish and what you write in English? Uh, that's, that's a very good question, Peter. That's a very good question. Yes, I think actually it is, it's, the material is slightly different. I think it comes out, it, 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 it does come out uh, differently. And, and it is sort of like a, basically another side of me that I, the, another aspect that gets to be dominant, that gets to, that gets to lead the, lead the word when I when I write in English um it's I I, I wrote in English for, for many years now uh and when did it begin I I think basically I think basically it began in university when I was writing papers in English I think that was actually the first and then it sort of I started writing some short stories and in, in English and then it sort of yeah, just took off slowly um, when I when I started writing again around the turn of the millennium, basically, um, and um, and but, but a funny thing happened is I, I I discovered that when I would when I would uh, board a flight, the the instant the instant I would I would sit there and then I could sort of observe my inner voice changing into an English inner voice. As soon as I was boarding a plane going, leaving the country, I would sort of switch into the English clouds, English speaking, uh, English dreaming, English everything clouds. So, so writing in that language also sort of flowed naturally from, from, the, from the fingers or from the, the, through the keyboard um, from that time. Um, I did write uh, 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 when I was in Sangam House in 2009. Uh, I did write a, 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 a manuscript for, for a novel that it it hasn't come out yet, but that was a uh, that was sort of like that really made my English writing take off because I produced like a tremendous amount of text in a very short time, and that was a, that, that whole flow was like 
that did something and that sort of cemented it and and and, and yeah it's it's been going on for for years and it is different material i don't know it's it, usually i usually it's very sort of I, I do tend to write a lot of political poetry. I do tend to write a lot of uh, systems critique, of uh, of uh, critique of power structures, and a lot about um, different vistas, uh, dystopian as well as utopian vistas for for tomorrow. Uh, um, I tend to sort of. I guess I. I do a lot of combining of, of sort of pop culture and esoterics and uh, um, and literary traditions and I, I, I think I do a lot of uh, eclectic uh, it becomes very eclectic it becomes very sort of uh, bringing together all sort of sources in that uh, flow usually free form but I also did a couple of collections uh, I, I did a collection of Danish limericks that is like a fixed form and that took me many years to get around because I, I i was introduced to the limerick as a young boy like 19 year old and and me and my buddies tried to do it in english but we just couldn't we just couldn't do it it was no, in danish we just couldn't get it to work and then many years later i wake up in my copenhagen apartment in the middle of the night peter and out flows the first limerick in danish and that became a, a, a collection which is uh, basically this one here um, it came out uh, some seven years ago, and now this uh, this fall I have actually a second collection of uh, verses coming out, and it's an ABC of yoga poems. So um, so so I also like to play with fixed sort of rhymes and stuff. Yeah, I mean you can't see now, but if you you know if your Facebook friends with uh, Klaus, you will know that he's also uh, a practitioner of yoga and a ferociously fit man, uh, you know, so you can't see all the muscle tone and all that right now because <laughs> he's, got, he's got his reading glasses on and he's being a writer at this point. But yeah, uh, he's, he's an athlete of, uh, you know, very, very fit man. But yes, uh, Klaus, uh, form, when it comes to poetic form, uh, and well, let's you, you talked about the difficulty of doing a limerick in Danish. Uh, and that's true of many other forms. If you try to write a haiku in English, it's a different feel, I guess, because I don't read or understand Japanese, but friends who do tell me that it's not the same thing. Uh, if you were to try to write, take an Indian form like the ghazal, uh, it does not lend itself. Of course, there have been very good ghazals written in English, but it does not lend itself as readily to uh, writing in English as it does uh, in Urdu. Or if you try to write a sonnet or whatever it is in a like, you know, it would be different. So mm -hmm. when you're writing, if you were, since the, you write in two languages, you write in Danish, you write in English, uh, you also do follow and speak other languages, right? Uh, I'm where do you find the limits of a certain language uh, coming to you? Like if you were writing in English, where does English fail you? If you were writing in Danish, where does Danish, when is Danish not enough? Uh, I th that's a very good, that's a very good question. Actually, I, I mean, I know that next week you're going to have Tishani Doshi here. Uh, and, uh, and I just basically translated her third collection of poetry called Girls Are Coming Out of the Woods. Uh, Lovely book. And uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic poems, uh, highly gifted, very creative, very strong. It's, 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 it was very, very happy to work with those poems. And it was a great learning experience to me because in, in working with those translations, I, 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 I bank my head into that exactly exact same thing that you're talking about time and time again, namely the, the difference in, 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 in sort of 
basically English is a much bigger language than Danish. There's many more words and, and concepts, and there is like tons of uh, extra synonyms for everything that we don't usually have. We might have them in Danish, but then again, you have to juggle it. That, that was a, um, it, it's a, well, it's a lovely thing. I think for me, it's like Sodoku with just with words, you need to, it's like a puzzle. You need to sort of negotiate the, 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 the field and, 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 and find the best solution. You have to find a key for the keyhole that opens the door to that certain meaning and fits with the rest of the, the, the imagery there and everything. So it's like, it's, it's very difficult, but it's fantastically funny also. And very much uh, it's, 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 it's mental gymnastics and linguistic gymnastics at its highest for me. I had so much fun doing it, but it was very difficult. It was very difficult because it's so, to, to <coughs> me, uh, the, the English in these uh, Tishani's uh, poems is like phenomenally advanced. It's, it's, it's not like, uh, it's, it's really high-end uh, English. He's a very, he's very, um, broad-minded uh, and, and intellectual uh, poet also and 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 that posed a challenge for me uh, which I really loved so yeah uh, there's many examples it's it's uh, where are you basically you have an expression in English where that, that there, it doesn't really have a counterpart in Danish it, you don't really have a word for that you don't really have the same word so you need to so you need to be creative, right? You can, sometimes you can look back into language and, and see, okay, do we have an old expression that, that fits? Usually we do, since there is a very close connections between, between uh, Old English and basically and Norse languages, basically Old Danish, uh, very close connections on many levels. Uh, but then again, would that make sense for a, for a contemporary audience? Maybe not so much. If, if you want young people to read the book, which you do, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not old, just old book aunties like, like myself, right? So, so that might not be the option. So you need to be creative in, in that sense. It's, it's, it's been funny. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, even translating a, a straight prose text, a narrative text would have its difficulties, but poetry with the nuance and the imagery and what you're trying to do with a poem is a very, very different animal. Translating poetry is that much harder, I think, you know, to get that feel of it back in. I mean, I tried this with a friend of mine who, who writes in, uh, in Hindi, but uh, a Hindi dialect. And she gave me the uh, translation, a uh, direct translation in English and told me what she was trying to do. And I sat with that for two or three days, trying to make it work and get the same feel to it. And uh, it just, it just it was just so hard. But, and this was just for fun. I wasn't doing it as a commission or any such thing, because I just said, let me try. But yeah, uh, what about you in uh, your, you know, your, you, you write, you said mainly, uh, you know, uh, free verse. Uh, what's, what about your relationship with form? And could you also, for the young people in the audience uh, who perhaps are considering, you know, doing more with poetry themselves, tell us how you approach a poem. Actually, let's just stay with that since we don't have that much time. How does Klaus Ankerson approach a poem from the moment that you think about it to the point that you can put it away and you say it's done? I, I think I, if I should give an advice, I mean, I, I think I, you should, first of all, uh, one should realize that if it's not captured immediately, it's lost. Uh, we, we, we do entertain this notion that we can remember every good idea and every little uh, sort of insight that we might get, that the universe might uh, serve us and that we might pick up on, but we don't. If you don't save it, it's gone. So, so make sure to jot it down on your telephone or in a notebook or scribble it on your hand or on a leaf, whatever by whatever means you can get it down and, and then it will then it, it, it can develop in, in various ways it's like a story it will it will gestate itself uh, some some poems will flow straight out of you and be more or less done others 
will always remain fragment fragments some will never be born some will be caught betwixt and between form and unform and become weird monsters that uh, then you have to go with that you know you have to sort of find a way to it's a dance basically like shiva and shakti it's a dance you need to dance with the poem you need to let it talk to you and let it come out of the paper and and yeah, but just jot it down. That's my most important advice to you. And just keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Or don't do it. Basically. How many times do you rewrite? How often do you work on? I mean, how long do you spend working on average? Because I know it will be different for different poems. Mm -hmm. But how, how long do you take to work? Or let's, do you write, put it away, and then come back to it cold? Or do you keep working at it over time? I, I, I do both. Uh, sometimes I, 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 I let it rest. And then especially when I'm, when I'm approaching a, a whole manuscript, I'm leaving it and then I'm coming back to it after some time. But it can't be too long time because then it's too cold. And then I just sometimes can't find my way back into it. So a little bit back and forth. Uh, but basically also don't move away from it for too long. If it's the, the bigger the text, in my experience, the bigger the text, the more volume you've got, the shorter time you can actually leave it uh, and come back into it. And you don't want to experience that last thing because once you're out, maybe your world has changed. Maybe you lost that key. And then forever you can't get into your own textual universe again. It's, it's gone. It's done. So, so do it while it's hot. Uh, eat it while it's hot do a dance with it while it's it's hot and uh, yeah sometimes i i reread i rewrite 10 times sometimes one time or none if it's, it's sometimes some poems are just the way they should be i think and then why would you yeah well you can do a little minor thing you know but i think also another very important uh, advice to the young aspiring writers uh, when you are in the context of creation, do not try to censor yourself, do not try to hinder yourself, do not try to judge your efforts, do not try to have this inner voice saying, oh yeah, it's like this and like that. It's a, it's a killer. You kill that inner voice, kill that censor, uh, kill that ego. It's, it's not necessary. You can always bring forth the inner editor after. But when you're creating, when you're in the flow, don't, don't do anything to disturb that flow because it is a form of transcendence and you are sort of out of body doing it. It is a shamanic endeavor, if you ask me, and don't mess it up by trying to sort of impose analysis on that process. Uh, was, you know, was it Edward de Bono who talked about the different kinds of hats that you wear at different times, or as Hemingway put it far more crisply, uh, right drunk, edit sober. Uh, yeah, 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 you can say that. You, can. <laughs> you know, I don't mean I, young people no. in the room. I am not saying you should be getting drunk, uh, but you should you should have the lack of inhibition of a drunk person. Let it go. And then you can bring the sober you back in to edit later. All right. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't exactly. stall yourself at the beginning. Plus, we could go on, but we are kind of running out of time. So uh, I'm going to ask you, I, I will conclude with a bit of thanks before bringing you back again, but I'm going to ask you to read us one more poem. And I'm going to ask you as a special favor, could you read us two more poems? Could you read us something in Danish, perhaps one of your limericks, so that we get the feel of how it sounds? And yeah. then, uh, you know, and another poem, maybe two small poems to wind up with. Uh, yes. I'm just going to say my thank yous to everyone. Thank you to everyone in the audience for making the time to join us with Poetry with Prakriti. Uh, we will be back next week with Tishani Doshi. Uh, I'm just going to paste in for you uh, how you can keep in touch. Just a second. This is how you can keep in touch with uh, the Prakriti Foundation and its various uh, social media avatars. Uh, do join us again next week with the Shani Doshi. Uh, and we will, of course, be continuing on with a different poet each time. Thank you very much for joining us here. Uh, thank you uh, to Professor Hima and your college. Thank you for bringing your students in for us. 
And thank you, Prakriti Foundation, for this lovely festival and for letting me be part of it and for letting me have this lovely conversation uh, with Klaus after 11 years after we first met in Chennai at Poetry with Prakriti. Uh, so thank you, everyone. And let us end, as we should, with a little bit more poetry. Klaus? Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, yes, let me read a, a Danish uh, limerick for you. Der var en slagter, som kom fra Mars, som var så ked af, hans navn var Lars. Han kaldte sig Lone, blev straks mand og kone, og fik småbørn, som lignede fars. Take one more. En kone, som kaldte sig Muslim, der lige godt lidt af en pusling. Hun var lille og stram, men fisen var for ram, så navnet blev hurtigt til kusling. Rowdy little limericks about? <laughs> Or are too naughty? Yeah, they're too naughty. They're too naughty. <laughs> Let's uh, let's. Uh, I would like to. Sh the, the, this one is about Indian traffic. Um, it's called elementary driving. You can probably recognize it. Raj Kumar owns a bike shop in the jungle near Oroville. Driving in India is like a video game. He tells me everything will come at you at any time from any side in any form. Truck, taxi, donkey, elephant, horse and snake, guards, kids and bicycles, two wheelers buses and everything in between, but you only have one life. So he saves mine in that very breath. And even though I got lost in the wilderness with nothing but night and scattered side road bonfires, crouching cloaked under a leering hair like moon, even drunk on too much rum, even with no helmet, even stoned and with a lady friend sitting behind me, both legs to one side, Vivekananda style, not to say Victorian. Raj Kumar's words drive with me. Be mindful and be slow, if not slow. Keep your third eye open, be like water, and always look for the path of no resistance. Everything can come at you at any time, from any direction. Remember to honk at all times. You only have one life. Thank you, Klaus. And Thank you, Peter. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.